Hi, I'm so excited to talk about this topic. Uh, this topic is kind of near and dear to my heart. Uh, I grew up down south. I was exposed to deer hunting as a, as a youth, as a ute. Um, and then I came, I went away from hunting for a long time. And when I came back to hunting, I was a grown adult. And so a lot of the things that I've learned hunting, I've learned as an adult. And so I'm very, you know, hunting as an adult is a very near and dear topic to my heart. It's also, you know, it also is, exemplifies that hunting is not a monolithic thing. You know, there's some folks who have been hunting waterfowl their whole lives and they've never thought about deer hunting and they don't even know where to start. So if you're here, if you're tuned in and you want to learn some tips or tricks or what to think about when you're coming to this and as an adult, I have some great, fantastic guests today. We've got our crack staff behind the scenes, keeping us on track and above above water, uh, Benji Cohen, our mentor coordinator, uh, Craig Kiger, our shooting sports coordinator, and Cassandra Hawkinson, our admin extraordinaire, are all back there making sure that, that we've got stuff rolling. If you need closed captioning, please open up the multimedia viewer on the bottom right-hand side of your screen, and you can get some closed captioning there. As we move forward, please direct all your questions into the Q&A panel in that bottom right hand as well. And that's gonna be much easier for us to navigate and, and keep track of stuff. So without further ado, let's get the ball rolling. And, and so this is the Outdoor Skills and Stewardship Series. This is a weekly webinar series where you can tune in to learn new stuff. You can find out information um, and you can ask DNR staff and guest questions. I mean, that's really kind of the magic of this is you actually have some real-time engagement with folks that hopefully know what we're talking about. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty unique kind of opportunity to do that. It's always, so far it's always been on Wednesdays at noon. That's, that's our plan to keep it moving forward. And really our goal here is for you, the audience, to learn about the hunting, fishing, and outdoor recreation opportunities that we have across Minnesota to share information on how the state uh, DNR is managing the wildlands and wildlife around us and to give you tips on how you can be stewards for these shared natural resources. Our upcoming topics, we've got a lot of great topics that are coming up. Next week, it's going to be uh, an introduction into trapping for fur bearers. January 5th, we're going to be talking about the really phenomenally successful high school clay target league and how that grew and what that does. And, and it's, it's, it blows me away as somebody who grew up down south. If you were going to sit here and tell me that a shotgun clay target program was more popular than hockey in the state of Minnesota in terms of participation, I wouldn't believe you. I would think you were trying to take my money, but it's true. It, we have more people shooting clay targets than we have lacing up hockey skates. So it, it's just a phenomenal program. It's going to be some great information about that. January 12th, we're going to be talking about ice angling for panfish. The ice is finally getting thick enough. I've, I've seen people out there. I haven't been brave enough to venture out because uh, I'm just a chicken. Um, and so I'm scared. I don't want to get wet or cold. And But it, it looks like people are out. And, you know, now's the time. We get It's it's time to get after some, some fish. And then shortly after that, we're going to be talking about dark house spearing. And then we're going to get back to hunting with some winter squirrel hunting uh, towards the end of January. So some really great topics coming up. Hope you can find um, something that's interesting to you and and really, really looking forward to that. Now, I am going to turn it over to our guest speakers. We have with us today two phenomenal um, adults who came to hunting as adults. I used adults too many times in that sentence. We have two phenomenal people who came to hunting as adults, uh, Julia Schrankler and Ken Yang, and I'm going to we're going to go over, you know, how they got into it. And some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about today is just, you know, getting started with gear. How do you find a place to go? How do you find people to do this with? And, and, and sharing your experiences and what that means. So, so with that, I'm going to ask Kang a very simple question that I hope is blatantly and transparently loaded with all sorts of open-ended meaning and opportunity and say, how did you come to hunting as an adult? <laughs> well, thank you, James, for the question. And thank you, James and Julia, for inviting me out to speak on this webinar. Um, yeah, so I started hunting because of my dog, um, Kaya. She's a German wire pointer. Uh, 
I started hunting five years ago with upland hunting, pheasant hunting, and the year after that, I started waterfall hunting and have been doing both since. Um, I do it just to, you know, make sure my dog gets to hunt. Um, that's really what it comes down to, you know. Besides that, you know, it's been a great journey since, so. That's, that's fantastic. Now, when you were growing up, was there hunting around you? Were like, were you hunting adjacent or, or, I mean, did you know people that were out there doing this stuff and it just never clicked until you had a dog and, and that really kind of motivated you? Yep. So my dad has a, is a big hunter. So he's hunted, he's from Laos. So he's hunted since he could walk pretty much. Um, and in, in the U S too, when he came here, he's been pheasant hunting, deer hunting, everything. And I, uh, I remember growing up seeing him bring home game and I was just never interested, never liked it. Um, and then, yeah, it just all clicked when I got my dog. So <laughs> that's really awesome. Yep. That's really awesome. Julie, I'm going to ask you the same transparently loaded question. You know, how did, how did you come into hunting as an adult? Well, it basically the same way, right? Like I followed my dog. Um, I, I grew up fishing. I grew up camping. Um, if there's any weapon that you're going to be on, you're going to hear dogs in the background. It's this one. I'm sorry. That's the, the next generation. Um, I, we had dogs in the past, um, who were sporting breeds, but they didn't display, um, sort of that, you know, prey drive and, um, in 2000, 2013, when we got our dog Ren, um, the, the light switch went on in her, right? Like she started pointing everything. She started pointing chickadees. She was like, so we didn't know what else to do with her, um, other than like sort of allow her to be trained. And, and I thought, why not try it? What, you know, what's the worst that could happen? Um, and, uh, and at the time I thought the worst thing that could happen was me turning vegan because I <laughs> couldn't handle it, but the exact opposite thing happened. She opened up my world and, um, and like, Kang, I, I do it. I go out for my dog. A lot of the times, like there are times I just do not want to get up at 4am and drive hours to be outside in the cold, but they, they love it. And there are companions and, um, and it's brought me other kinds of companionship, friends, family, um, and, and community. So yeah. I just, I, I wouldn't stop. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. I, there's, there's something we talk about when we talk about introducing new people to hunting. Um, and it's called the, it's, we call it the social support network, right? And it's, it's, it's basically finding your people. And it sounds like you both found your people in dogs, like dogs were your people. And that's what, that's what kind of leveraged a lot of opportunity and, and um, exposure to things. That's really, that's really, really cool. Um, so, you know, through that, through that process, you know, what, what was that like starting out following your dogs? King, like, you know, you, you kind of had a little bit of a hunting background with your, I mean, your, your family, your dad had, had some, had some, you know, you, it was pretty short distance for you to go to be like, Hey, you know, when you're going out, how are you doing this stuff? Um, and Julie, it sounds like you ne didn't necessarily have that. So, you know, what, what was that like when you, when you first started out? Um, yeah, yeah I'll go first. So when, you know, my dad, he's kind of a tough uh, teacher. So he's like, either you learn it by making mistakes or you don't learn it at all. Right. And so pheasant hunting, you know, he's taught me you know, the basics, like how, like, this is what public land looks like. This is the dates that you have to go out or, you know, that you're able to go out. Um, but when it came to waterfall hunting, which, you know, I'm going to speak more on in this webinar and hopefully there's some waterfall new guys that want to try waterfall hunting and have some questions. But, you know, I didn't have um, a mentor there to teach me how to, where to scout, where to look for ducks, you know, identifying ducks and stuff like that. And so it was, uh, it was very interesting. It's kind of a, you know, with pheasant hunting, it was pretty simple. You know, I just listened to my dad and go from there. But duck hunting, it was a challenge. It was, uh, you know, I needed that sense of community to help really keep me going um, from other people and not just, you know, my dog, but finding people that will help me become a better hunter, duck hunter. So. Yeah. And, and duck hunting is, it's a different, like, I, I've just started getting into duck hunting. Okay. Like I, I didn't grow up doing it. And, um, it's one of those things that it, it feels compared to the other hunting I've done. It just, it, 
feels intimidating. And I don't know if it's the gear. I don't know if it's the, the habitats. I don't know if it's the, the, um, just, just the, it can be a nonstop sort of thing where you've just got ducks swirling around you and, and, and it's just a very different form of hunting. And so that's, yeah, that, that feels like a steeper, steeper curve than, than some other things. So, so yeah. having that help definitely has, that's had to have been clutch. Julia, what, you know, what about you when you, when you, when you started out, like, so you decided to go down this path and then how, what was that like? Like, did you, did you just sit there and scratch your head and be like, did, did you know anybody that was hunting at that time? No, I mean, I, I really like, this is going to sound horrible, but I was basically Googling it. Right. Like there's like, and, and luckily, um, and I'm, that's why I'm grateful for this webinar too. Like this is the DNR is how I got started really um, with firearm safety and a becoming in the outdoors woman event and that sort of thing. And, and even I've met some of my, closest hunting friends through DNR activities or through conservation groups, right? Like volunteering is a great way to connect with people. Um, but it really came down to, to Googling and research. And, you know, like, I'm hoping that in our talk today, we can kind of jump start that and like, here are some, here's some links, here are some places to start and, um, and hopefully pe get people to the point where they're going to commit to one future activity, just one um, after today, because at the end of the day, you just have to do it, right? Like, like to King's point about, you gotta learn by experience too. It, it can't just be read. So um, yeah. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, and, and that's, and it's, it's one of those things I've said it frequently that, you know, we no longer live in an information limited society. I mean, we, we've got, you type in, how to learn hunting and you're going to have a gazillion pages and so just that by itself can be overwhelming so hopefully yeah as, as we move forward we're we're going to have some links for folks um you know the the minnesota dnr has a ton of content to get people out and to learn how to do the stuff we even have species specific hunting guide pages so trying to give you as much information as we can up front so that you can you know have a very short list of, of pages that you're clicking on to find out additional information. So, you know, getting into that, let's, let's, let's get in, let's roll up our sleeves a little bit and get into it. But, you know, Julia, when we're talking about this stuff, wh what are you looking for? You know, when you started, you know, how, how, how did you, how did you go from, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in doing this, because gear can be a really intimidating thing. Like people are like, oh, I'm, I'm not ready. I don't have the stuff. So, so how did you handle that? Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to give some advice here that maybe long-term hunters would, would laugh at, but like, really, I started shopping my own closet in a lot of ways. Right. Like, so we camped, um, uh, my wife and I camped. So like I, I had some things that worked like hiking boots or hiking shoes and that sort of thing. Um, but, but really, especially starting out, you actually don't know, or at least I didn't know what was going to work for me and people will, people will help and people will give advice and, and share what works for them. It, but it's kind of nice to experience it or, or see it in, in real time. So if you get, if you get the basics, if you get, you know, like the, the required amount of blaze or, or, or camouflage, and that can be super, super cheap. It can, you can find it at, and you know, on sale at the right time of year. And um, uh, I th James, I think you had talked about earlier finding it like, you know, like at thrift stores and stuff too um, around Halloween. Um, but like you get a couple of layers, you get some, you get some basic clothing um, and then you'll go out and you'll figure out what works. I've hunted in jeans. It's not fun eventually <laughs> really cold and really wet you know there's a reason i recommend people keep a change of dry clothes in the vehicle for after a hunt um but it really it you really have to ask yourself what tools you actually need before you get out there and what basics you might really truly have on hand um you don't need a you don't need an entire kit to do a walk along um or to do um a single event um you do need to be legit. <laughs> I can't stress enough that everybody has to have the right license. 
um, and have access to the regulations. You can you can get the print, you can keep carry your phone and have a link to it. Um, that is, I like sometimes when I th think about gear, I don't think about the license, but if I start there, that's the one thing you can't compromise on. But um, yeah, shop shop your shop your closet first. You'd be surprised. Yeah, yeah, Julie, I agree. When I started pheasant hunting, my first two years, I hunted in sweatpants or windbreakers. So not even jeans, because I'm a bigger guy. I need to be flexible. You know, you're doing high knees in the fields. And I'm like, I want to spend $120 on some branded upland pants, right? I don't have that kind of money. So it was sweatpants and windbreakers for me. And then that was you. That was you out there. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, you know, absolutely. You know, that's I, you know, and and that's a that's a tremendous point. You, you know, folks, most of the folks, if you're living in Minnesota, you you've got gear that keeps you warm in the winter, and that's that's going to be a great place to start. You've probably got at least one pair of quasi decent winter boots that, you know, when things get slushy and messy, you know, if, so if you're going to go out on a, you know, on a on a less active hunt like maybe a deer hunt or a turkey hunt where you're sitting still for long periods of time, you know, bundling up is 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 totally uh, you know, you, you probably already have stuff. I know folks who have brought sleeping bags and blankets into the woods. Like it's not, you know, nobody's gonna, there's no cool police that's out there, uh, to, 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 to ridicule you. It's, it, it really is. If you're comfortable, the more comfortable you can make yourself, the more you can commit to the time being out there and patience will get you more sightings and opportunities than anything else. So, Try to gear up um, as best you can. Benji uh, just popped in the chat um, links to buy a license, where you can buy a license online and the rules and regs. Um, make sure uh, you know which license, some licenses, some hunting, you need a physical tag to attach to the animal. Make sure you know which one that is um, so that you can have it. Uh, and if you have to have it mailed to you, give yourself plenty of time to get that mailed to you. We've since, since the world changed in 2020 and everybody's been at home, we've had a lot of requests for licenses and, and mail licenses. So make sure you give yourself plenty of time to, to get that stuff uh, moving forward. Um, and, and Julia raises a great point with make sure you know which type of hunting requires blaze hunting and which doesn't. You know, some forms of hunting don't. Archery deer does not. Turkey does not. Waterfowl does not. Um, but pretty much everything else requires at least some. So make sure you read up on that. And those, uh, that blaze, you can get a real, like Julia said, you can get an inexpensive vest and hat combo. You know, usually you can see those at big box retailers for under 10, 12 bucks. So it's not a, it's not a huge investment. And honestly, it's a good idea to have it in the fall anyway. You know, having some high vis blaze orange, even if you're not out there hunting. It's not the end of the world uh, if you're on public land to be wearing something that's pretty visible because you don't know who's out there hunting, and and so being safe is is always a is always a great great idea. Um, I did say you know I, I mentioned to Julia when I when I really committed to becoming to getting into hunting um, in grad school in Madison, you know there, I noticed that um, a lot of the local thrift stores would put out camo uh, right around Halloween so that people could get army soldier costumes. Well, that's $3 for a camo jacket that I can wear hunting and I don't mind if it gets shredded up because it's a pretty minimal investment. It's not like, not like some of the gear now, which is almost so expensive. I don't want to get it scratched because it, <laughs> I, it's silly. It's, it's, it's silly. Um, so yeah, those are opportunities. And Actually, now is a great time to be looking at some of this stuff. If you are looking at gear, if you are looking at, at, at things that you think you're going to need to get on this adventure, um, it's kind of the end. It's kind of the, the universal end. Like hunting is winding down and, and everybody's shifting to, to ice fishing up here. Um, so a lot of stores have stuff massively marked off. Um, a lot of the, there's a lot of great deals that are out there. They're just trying to get inventory off their shelves. So if there's something that you've been looking at or thinking about, Now's a great time to be looking at it because there's there's some really steep discounts on a lot of quality stuff. All right, we're gonna keep the show rolling here, um, and I'm gonna just speak really quickly, and I'd like to hear Julia and King's comments on this because I'm always I'm always looking for feedback. But 
you know, if you decide that this is something you want to do and you've gone in your closet and you've gone out a couple times and it just clicks and you're like, yep, I'm in, I want to do this, giddy up, let's go. For me, there are really four things, four types, categories of gear to invest in. And they're the four Bs. You know, we've got our boots. Um, about the only thing that drives me out of the field quicker than a wet butt is soaking wet feet. I just, I, I can't do it. I, they can't do it. So invest in some boots. You know, this is something, they're a long-term item. You can wear them a lot. It's not just going to be when you go out hunting. Um, binoculars, bins, or other optics is something that I found I just can't cut corners on. If I get cheap, I've got, I've tried to get cheap binoculars in the past and they're more of a hindrance than a help. And so just invest in some binoculars or whatever other optics you're going to buy. Um, that's something that, you know, those binoculars there, you can use them for other things as well. You know, you can use them for bird watching, you can use them for um, whatever other activities you want to look at uh, that happening far away. Um, base layers are something that I found are worth the investment. Uh, I am a personally a big fan of Merino wool, the new lightweight Merino wool that has come out in recent years. It's really exploded. There's a lot of opportunities you can have to buy this stuff from a variety of vendors. Um, and it's just really great stuff. It, it's naturally odor resistant. It insulates when it's wet. Um, oh, Julia's cheating. She just got Nixie up in the screen. Oh. Um, ah, photo bond by a dog. Um, Sorry, everybody. I'm, I'm trying to keep things kind of sane over here. <laughs> you're, that's, hey, if, if the dog is what got you into hunting, we should, we should be, uh, we should be thanking her. Well, Nixie didn't, Ren did, but, you know. And then the last thing is just, is bullets and, uh, or uh, other ammunition. You know, quality ammunition is really worth the investment. These days, it's really, I mean, it's been really hard for over a year now to, to find quality ammunition. So, um, you know, it's, that's going at a premium. Do you guys have other stuff that you think is, is worthwhile investment or do you, you agree with those or what do you think? Yeah, I uh, definitely agree with those. Um, and with waterfall hunting, you know, you want to get some good waders, some good dry waders, because you're going to be out in the water a lot. And, you know, if you're planning to either hunt early season or late season in the winter, then, you know, again, base layer and uh, warmer clothing would be, you know, definitely a need. So something you want to invest in. I would say anything that um, contributes to your comfort and safety, this is not time to rough it. This is the time to smooth it. And um, you're out there, you're putting out energy, um, you're getting exercise, you're getting fresh air. It and it will, it'll, it'll shut down a hunt pretty fast. Um, same thing with bringing people. I love to bring new people, I check their footwear and make sure that they're dressed warmly enough um, or not too warmly, right? You know, if you're warm at the car on an upland hunt, you're going to be stripping layers off 20 minutes out. Um, so it's it's just, you know, it's okay to be comfortable while hunting. It's yeah. you know, it's not a moral failure to be comfortable. Are there, so with, with y'all being big dog hunters, are there things that you just haven't, like you know you can't skimp on for the dogs? One would be an e-collar. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about that. And then um, a stapler and pliers. So, you know, in case they rip through barbed wire or my dog has a tendency for some reason to get like twigs stuck up her nose lately. And my little needle nose pliers have been so handy. So those are like the three things I'd have for sure. I was going to say a, a good, a good uh, sort of first aid kit. Um, and that could look, I, pliers are it seems really weird to be like I need my pliers I've got my dog out my pliers but it works for a lot of things and then um I actually I don't use the staples I use a I use wrap I use like sports wrap um you can kind of bandage stuff on the go um it can be useful for things um that but yeah it really comes down to security and I do have an e-collar um it helps with location and it serves as my gps too but when i first started hunting i didn't um and and you can you know what i mean like seriously 
get out there, you'll figure out pretty quickly what works or what doesn't. Like, it sounds really weird, but like when you're out there, you'll get an idea of what you what you're missing or what what could make things easier. Nice, fantastic, yeah. That stapler that kind of caught my eye. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, you, yep. Um. All right. So, how do y'all find where to go? How did you start finding where to go? Kang, I'll, I'll ask you first. Where, where, how, when you were like, okay, now I want to do this, where do I go? How, how, how did you make that first decision? Yeah, so, you know, when I said waterfall hunting, um, you know, when we started, my buddy, I didn't really didn't want to waterfall hunt. My buddy has a lab, and he's like, we should go waterfall hunt. I was like, well, I don't really want to shoot dogs. And he's like, come with me. We both go hunting dogs. And he's like, let's go here. And I was like, well, did you scout it yet? And he's like, no. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, we'll win it. So we go there, and, you know, it's like, a trail with water around here and there and you know from there on i was like all right well if i'm gonna do this let's do it the right way so you know where i found it went was just looked at the geography of minnesota right um looking at where the prairie pothole is you know ducks are known for breeding the prairie pothole so, so i'm gonna stick to the western southwestern side um i don't have a boat but i have a dog so i can't get into those boggy areas in the northeast you know part of the states and stuff like that. Um, and then from there, just kind of say, you know, ducks like water, find places with water. You know, we have WPAs, WMAs with water. Um, a tip I'd give for people is, if you're new to hunting, you're trying to find a duck spot, go look for a big lake. So just pick any big lake and then look for small little WMAs around it with water, you know, cause the big lake will attract them, but then they'll come and rest on smaller spots where it's less windy or less you know yeah pressure so that's what that's where i found um and yeah of course i use the dnr recreation compass um third-party apps those are great uh such as onyx Huntwise, there's a, there's a whole bunch out there um but yeah um just understanding your i think your geography too is what it's gonna, it's gonna be key so Nice. Julia, same question. You know, when you first started, you were like, all right, now I've got it. I'm ready to go hunting. Where do I go? How did, how did you make that call? Well, I have to admit, I, I again, turned to the keyboard, but um, like to, to Kang's point, like knowing the geography of the state you're in is really important. And I never knew that I'd have to know where all the counties in Minnesota are because the recreation compass really, it, it does work off of counties. So um, having some kind of having a paper map even next to um, next to your keyboard, next to your monitor helps. Um, I I'll be honest. I without the hunter walking trails, I don't think I would have been exposed to as much grouse area um, without that tool. Um, and I hate to do this to people, but like you know, aside from following well known grouse um, you know camps or or conservation orgs, like you kind of got to get out there to learn what works, right? So you could you could look at it on the map, but until you get out there and then you experience birds or or don't, that's kind of how you learn you, you learn the actual habitat. Um, and once you start learning that, those mapping tools become a lot easier to read. It's almost it's like it's unlocking a key. Um, and without WMAs, I am all for and I strongly support people knocking on the doors for for access to private land, but having public land, I don't have to do that, right? That's my land, that's your land. We get out on that. We can just, you don't have to ask. There's some etiquette and some safety, but but the reality is, as you pull up to the parking lot, no one else is there, it's yours to explore. And, um, and you can find it all on the DNR site. And there's a couple of different ways to do it. That's a great point. And those, those third-party apps, they they are really tremendous. Most of them charge uh, a fee or a subscription of some sort. The really thing about those those apps, all of the data, all of the data that they're pulling is freely available. The reason you're paying a fee is because they put it all into one place. So it's it's a convenience fee more than anything else. So, you know, you can get plat map information free. Uh, a lot of it's online. Um, you can get boundaries information free. A lot of it's online. 
Um, but those third party apps really do a, a really tremendous job of making a, a very easy user interface and making it just like one stop shopping instead of having five or six different sources of information. So they are a tremendous tool in the toolbox. Um, they also make sharing locations really easy. Um, you know, I've had, you know, more than once I've I've gone out, you know, I'm I'm still fairly new to the state. I just came in 2017 and and so I'm constantly, you know, people could tell me XYZ landing on the St. Croix and I'm not gonna have any clue where it is, but they can drop a pin and and send it to me and I can I can find where they're at. So those are those are really great suggestions. Um, and so, you know, building off of that, you know, we kind of talked about, you know, some of the very intro gear stuff, you know, where do you start? And multiple times now, the theme has been talk to other people, find out where, how they're doing it. Um, you know, so how do you, that requires making connections. So how do you, how do y'all make those connections? Julia, why don't you start with this one? How, how are you making those connections? I, you know, my very first um, experiences were for with hunting came through um, becoming an outdoorsman. I, I I wouldn't it and it gave me a real leg up um, and it introduced me to um, guides um, and 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 people might tell you that <laughs> hunters don't want to share their places with you or or that kind of stuff but the reality is hunters really do want to recruit other hunters and they're so helpful and all you have to do is all you have to do is ask or and if you don't get an answer you will ask how you could get an answer to um i the i can't speak enough for like the conservation orgs um and i'm gonna name drop them like i without pheasants forever or the rough grouse society and following them online i don't I wouldn't learn as much as I learned in as short a time as I learned. And um, and they and they have opportunities online. Even like modern carnivore has have huge, huge content items online um for for you to enjoy. Um and not just enjoy, but learn from. There's some there's TV shows too. Um and of course the DNR site. I've turned to the DNR site just by doing a search, like, how do I X, Y, Z? And there, there it is. Um, in general, if you ask the questions, um, it pops up and it's kind of funny too. Once you start doing this, you realize how many friends or family members, even if they don't know, they might be interested and, and they're willing to share or willing to look too. Absolutely. King, how did, how did you make your connections? You know, you said you had a friend that took you out duck hunting for the first time. You know, what, what are some of the ways that you got plugged into this stuff? Yeah, so he, he, that was his first time duck hunting too, but you know, we didn't know anybody that duck hunted. And <laughs> when you get into the duck hunt community, it, it can be kind of tough. You kind of have to have tough skin. People are very, um, either they, they joke around too much or, you know, they're, they're kind of zip, lips tied, right? Um, and what got me into, uh, into it more, more was conservation organizations such as Delta Waterfowl. You know, they, their mission spoke to me and not just that, but the people there, they were very welcoming and inviting. And that was kind of like uh, 180 from what I see on, you know, Facebook, right? So, you know, I joined them, you know, attended the banquets, you know, joined the committee, just make friends and talk to them. And, you know, when we're doing stuff, just ask questions like, hey, how did you set up your decoy rig, right? Um, how do you set up your spread? like? That kind of, you know, when you find your community in that sense, uh, it's easier to ask for help um, to get you started. So conservation I, organizations I, are for sure my number one. I, I want to I want to double down on that, too, like in, including volunteering. Like you might not be able to hunt, but if you can if you can show up and be helpful at a banquet, you meet so many people and everybody's there because they love hunting. Nobody's nobody's there to like ask you what you're doing here or or make fun of you because you don't know things it's it's really to you find the generosity um when you show up with generosity and it's um it's out there it's absolutely out there and 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 experienced hunters see that right like it's it's one thing like i've i've met more than a couple experienced hunters that are like if somebody shows up and puts in the work 
I'm happy to take them out. If they come up and they just want my spots, I'm not saying a thing. So like if it, you know, people see that, people can see those motivations, they can see that enthusiasm. Um, and, and I think that another important thing for new hunters to realize is that, you know, hunting, hunters are not a monolithic entity. There's a wide variety in how people hunt, the motivations for why people hunt, um, the the willingness to accept new people to come along with them, and and that can be a little bit of a challenge because you do you have to find the people that click with you and that you click with, and so um, just being persistent with that and 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 getting involved is is a great way to do that because you really quickly you find out who you work well with and 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 who who you don't work well with. Um, so I'm I'm anxious to get us into the chat because we our chats the q a has been lighting up um i've been talking way too much i apologize for that um you know so what's next we can we're going to start out getting into some q a and some questions like i said be persistent uh you know if 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 somebody if you make a connection with somebody and they're like frequently they're like oh i'll, I'll take you out you know just just hit me up they're not going to track you down you know, you gotta you gotta follow up with them, um, and you gotta recognize that they they have a life and they've got other stuff going on too. So if it doesn't work out, you know, don't you know don't don't look at it as oh well he you know he had to cancel on me one day so I'm not gonna do it again or I'm not gonna ask him again or him or her. You know, it's like keep keep going. You know, and and people see that as well. And there are a lot of there are a lot of experienced hunters that you know they are losing their hunting buddies. And they're looking for new new hunting partners. And I knew a guy in Wisconsin who specifically looked for new adult hunters because he didn't want to carry the blind into the woods. So he was he was he was happy as can be when a twenty something year old came up and was like, "Hey, could you take me hunting?" He'd be like, "Absolutely, pick up that bag. We're gonna go for a walk." So, you know, they're they're out there and, and they they want to help. Um, you know, to to Julia's point. Um, Plan one activity and commit to it. Just just get out there once, um, and 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 see what it's like. Because, and you can start with taking a walk. Just take a walk because it's hunting is a different way of being in the woods. When I'm bird watching, when I'm trail running, I'm out there. Somebody else put that trail in there. I'm following somebody else's opinions on the best way to move through that area. When I'm hunting, I'm following the animals, and they have very different ideas. Follow the tracks, see see how they intersect with the trails that people put in there. Especially here in the metro, we have a tremendous opportunity. There, there are deer and turkey in downtown St. Paul. You don't have to go far to look at these things and see how they move and see how they act. Now, they may not act the same as they do in the, in the, in the North Woods, but it gives you a place to start. It lets you start seeing how they're moving, what they're looking for, and how they're interacting with their environment. And that is very valuable information. And it's frequently information that people aren't looking at before they start hunting. Um, this last thing, start paying attention to deadlines. If you're a new hunter, you're not necessarily tracking or you're interested in hunting, you're not necessarily tracking on the fact that sometimes there are deadlines in the summer for the fall hunting opportunities. Um, so start looking at stuff on the website, start looking at when there are deadlines. You know, um, Benji and I were just talking before the show that Wisconsin has a lottery system for their first uh, few seasons of turkey hunting. That lottery closed on December 12th, on December 10th. You know, uh, Minnesota doesn't do that anymore. But if you're deer hunting in the fall, there are areas that are a lottery system that you need to have that application in in August. So just, you know, start, Start paying attention to the stuff. Start looking at the stuff. If you're interested in it, if you think you're interested in it, take a look now. Put a date on your calendar so that it automatically reminds you so that the stuff doesn't sneak past you and you're caught flat-footed in the fall. And then connect, like we've said repeatedly, connect with us, connect with others. Um, it, it's there's a there's a lot out there. So do y'all have anything else to add before we get into the QA? Nope. Well said, James. All right. All right, here we go. Um, let me see. Uh, are there any stats? So Kat, uh, Caitlin is asking if we have any st stats about the makeup of hunters, new hunters in Minnesota. Um, I was recently told there are more women entering the hobby, whereas men have been stable or declining. Um, well, way to way to ask a an, a, an easy one at the at the beginning, uh, Caitlin. Um, 
they're, 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 the numbers are there. <laughs> um, for new hunters, we, we, we don't really have a way to identify who's a new hunter and who's not. We do have a way to identify who's buying licenses and we can track that over time. From 2000 to about 2015, things were stable for resident hunting licenses purchased just under 500,000 and that's deer and upland birds um, and, and, and small game. Um, from 2015 to 2019, we saw some steady declines in those licenses and then 2020 happened and everybody went outside again. So we saw a big spike after uh, in 2020. Um, between 20, um, basically 2008 to 2016, women were the only segment that were increasing in their participation. Um, everybody else was declining. Uh, but since 2016, women have started trending down as well. Now, again, 2020, everything popped back up. So we're trying to work with keeping that interest going forward. Uh, so that's that's what the trends have been. Um, nationwide, we've seen some really dramatic declines, um, particularly with small game hunting. That's been the biggest uh, area where we've seen declines uh, in participation. And it went from Oh, uh, I believe in the early 90s, it was somewhere around over 9% of, of Americans hunted. And by 2016, we were down to 4.5%, uh, under 4.5%. So those are percentages. The population's growing quicker than we're losing hunters. So there's a little bit of exaggeration there. But but um, yeah, we're, we are seeing declines in participation over time. All right, our next question from Lily is just puppy exclamation point. So um, that's definitely, definitely noticed. And, and Nixie is a very cute puppy. Um, boots are great, but boots aren't much good without good socks. That's a fantastic point. Um, Mary's saying that she likes to use um, alpaca socks and some smart wool. Yeah, good socks are awesome. Um, the reason why socks aren't on my list is because I can usually find them fairly inexpensively and on discount sale, and I don't usually have to break the bank to pay for them. But yeah, socks, invest in some socks. They're a fantastic investment. Um, invest in a friend who can take you out and show you the ropes. Absolutely. Um, and then as you're accumulating gear, you know, having just investing in one per year is a good idea. You know, you don't have to do it all at once. Um, fantastic, fantastic idea. Okay, question from Mary. Would you recommend a dry hunt in which you pack everything and go to hike and sit in the blind just to see if you are comfortable and have what you need? So basically just a, a trial, a trial run. You're not necessarily actually going to hunt, but, you know, just setting everything up and seeing if you've got what you need. Um, my opinion is no, don't, don't do a trial. Really? Yeah. Don't do a trial on hand, Mary. If you're going to hunt, then just go for it. Do it. You know, um, you're learning every time you, I mean, me personally, every time I go out, I'm learning, you know, I'm learning whatever I need this time versus what I need next time. Right. And so, you know, just have your basics, you know, something to keep you comfortable and warm, something to keep you safe and have a plan of where you're going in and when you're coming out. Um, whether it be if you're deer hunting or turkey hunting, something with a blind or, you know, yeah, just, you know, um, go and hunt, you know, and that way you're not wasting time, really, is what I'm trying to say. And, you know, you might get lucky and a deer might walk up while you're there in full, you know, blaze orange or whatnot, so... <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to spin, I'm going to spin on that a little bit because I do like at least set up, like speaking as a camper, right? You set up your gear for the first time in your backyard. You don't really want to be out there trying to, trying to figure out your gear or how to, how to load your gun or anything like that. I mean, obviously everybody would go through firearm safety and stuff, but, um, and from an upland point of view, I look at that, I'm like practice hunt is scouting, right? I, if I'm, if I'm going camping, someplace I might take a drive um, with the map and just drive past WMAs and just see what the habitat's like, see if I see birds on the road, that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, but that's, 
that's when hunting becomes a lifestyle. Like when you're, when you're hunting all year long, when you're training your dog all year long, when you're like, you know, when it crosses over from activity to lifestyle, but, um, I, I see the wisdom. I see the wisdom in what, what King's saying, like, just get, just get out there and do it. And what's the worst that going to happen? Like, yep. no one needs to know if your hunt is like 40 minutes long. Exactly. No one needs to know. Yep. No one needs to know. It's your hunt. Yep. Um, so yeah, give it a shot. I, yeah. And I, so that rem I, at one, when I was learning to turkey hunt, I asked the guy who was teaching me, I was like, you know, I was going to go scout this area. I was just going to walk around. And he just goes, well, take your gun. Like, just yeah. scout with your gun. Because if one shows up, you can shoot it. And I yep. was like, okay, fair. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And, and, and to Julia's point, you know, there's no, <laughs> nobody's on the clock. Like, you're not punching in. And punching out you you do this how you want to do it and and make sure you know as long as if you're being safe if you're being ethical it's it's your hunt and um if you're not comfortable you know i i've known more than one hardcore deer hunter who got cold after about 45 minutes and packed it up and went home because it's it, it ain't worth it um so just 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 do it do what you need to do and and um yeah it, there's there's plenty of opportunity there um let me see i have no trouble fishing and cleaning fish but i've never hunted before and i'd like to deer hunt maybe rabbit not sure about game birds but my concern is not being able to dress out what i hunt any advice um look at you know for any game there's always many techniques i mean many people are showing techniques on youtube you know, um, Modern Carnivore has some stuff on game, like cleaning, like uh, the gaming cleaning part, don't worry about it, I would say. Um, it's get the game first and, you know, go at it. Try it. If you make a mistake the first time, you know, you accidentally rip the breast in part, you know, it's fine. Um, but, you know, you won't know unless you try, right? But there's always, there's a lot of guides and a lot of videos and tutorials out there to help you, so. I'd like to add that you can also, you can also be a guest, right? Like becoming the, uh, in our Becoming an Outdoors Woman um, event, uh, we did get pheasant and that was part of the experience. Part of the experience was like, here's, here are like two different ways to clean them. And, um, and I, I finally ventured into the world of deer hunting this year. And I, and I was a guest, I was a guest of a friend of mine who is, He's a friend. He's also a mentor. And he was very, very specific about making sure that I saw how to field dress the deer and any slowed down and he, and he explained everything because it, it is, it can be really, really intimidating the first time in person. Um, and as somebody who is, has brought other people hunting and, and helped them with cleaning and stuff, it's, I'm always like, you're not going to hurt you're not going to hurt the bird now. <laughs> the bird doesn't feel it. It's okay. You don't like it. Um, but there's, yeah, you just, eventually you're just going to have to do it. Yep. And, and I think the thing that's a lot of new hunters, if you can gut a fish, you can gut a deer. It's just, we're all tubes within tubes when it comes down to it. And so, um, you know, just, if if you can if you can clean a fish, it's the same principle. There's just a few more steps, and it's a little bit more involved. So don't don't let that um, stop you. We have we we've got a lot of questions, so we're gonna. Um, I don't think we're gonna be able to get to all of these. Some of them are more statements than questions. So I'm really gonna be focusing on the question questions, um, so yep. that we can get some stuff answered. Ba, ba, ba. Um, we've, we've talked a little bit about the groups to connect and volunteer with, um, you know, any of the conservation organizations that are out there are a great place to start. Um, you know, this is actually a really good question. You know, what are some of the unbro unspoken etiquette rules a newbie should know about their first group hunt? Can, could, could y'all speak on that? Yeah. I think one unspoken rule is to, you know, bite your tongue. If you are a new person in a group hunt, just bite your tongue. They want to do it this way, then let them do it this way, right? If they want to, if they say, if they tell you to do something, then you do it. 
Um, and if you don't like it later on, then, you know, you don't hunt with them later on or you find things that you like and you don't like. And so, you know, that's one of the things I would give as a advice to a new hunter or a newbie joining a first group hunt. Just yeah, like, you're, you're definitely a guest. Um, there's room to ask questions and that sort of thing. But in, in general, um, you know, like your, your role is to observe as a participant um if anything and and kind of like if you if you've got a good match they'll help you along they'll explain I, sometimes i even over explain i'm like i might tell you stuff you already know that's okay i'm just gonna tell you anyway um there are some there are some things i'm gonna speak as a dog owner here please whatever you do do not give another dog don't give a dog owner's dog an order or a command, like, unless they tell you to, like, if they're like, hey, you know, hey, will you, you call her over or, um, you know, maybe say good dog or something, but like, there's, I, I've even had it accidentally slip out once or twice and I'm like, oh my God, I'm, I'm so embarrassed. Like, you just let the dog owners handle their dogs. Um, Cause they're, they're out there trying to make a successful hunt and it's about safety. That's a great point. Um, let me see. How can hunters get access to private land owned by large corporations? Uh, it's difficult and possible sometimes to find an owner to ask for permission, but these locations can be great hunting spots. That's a little advanced. Um, yeah, you know, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really advanced. I mean, there's that, ways that, to do it, but there, there's ways to do it. But there, I mean, there's there so. I, I think that's a little beyond the scope of this talk, but honestly, there's some land manager somewhere. There's some property manager somewhere, and that would be the place to start. Now, it might take a lot of digging to find that property manager, um, and and um, but that's where I would start. Um, let me see more detail on where to get ammo right now. Anywhere you can. Like right now, ammo is tough, tough, tough to find. There are multiple web crawlers that will scour the internet. And if you sign up for them, they'll, it'll actually send you an alert that's like, oh, hey, that ammo you're looking for at this price point is now available. Um, you know, that's, that's what I would recommend at this point um, because it, it is, it's really tough. Um, I was gonna say, feel free to tell us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I am all ears yeah. if you know where. Right, right. This is a joke, but you know we get a 10% finder's fee for telling you that information. So any ammo you find, we get 10% up. No, I'm, I'm, that's a total joke. Um, where can I learn to clean my rifles? We have a webinar on that. If you go to our uh, webinar homepage and look up uh, our gun maintenance, Craig Kiger, our Northwoods guru, he and I talked about that uh, back in the summer. So that's a great place to start. And you can go from there. Um, do I need to buy a gun to get started? Uh, my biggest barrier is not wanting to keep guns in my house. I would say no. Can I, can I weigh in there? I, I've taken people along for walk-alongs. You don't have to have a gun to walk along. And, and that's actually a really good way to meet someone who probably has a gun to loan as well. I mean, I, I do have two shotguns and one is my field gun that, you know, like I'm more than happy to share that for an experience with somebody who's undergone a uh, firearm safety training. And um, there's, there's connections out there. Again, find your people, you find a path in a lot of ways. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great point. And, you know, there's most, I've heard it said a couple of times now, new hunters that come into this that never grew up with guns, they are quickly surprised at how rapidly they all of a sudden have more than one gun in the house. Um, you know, I, I went from zero guns in the house to I think nine at one point because um, I had two different sets of friends that like were leaving the city and were like, hey, can you babysit this while I'm gone? And because they knew I was a responsible gun owner. And, and so then I was like babysitting other people's guns. The point is, is that there are usually plenty of guns around. On, on for for this stuff and so finding people that already have them my bigger point would be and recommendation would be no matter what gun you're using make sure you were practiced at it make sure you get practice with it so that 
you're not handling it for the first time in the field because you don't want to be thinking about that. You want to be able to know how that gun operates. So if you're going to go upland hunting, you know, go skeet shooting with it before you go or skeet or trap shooting with it before you go out upland hunting, learn how it works, learn where the switches are, learn how the safety operates, loading, unloading, all of that in a safe controlled environment. Cause once you're in the field, you want to be focusing on making a good shot and, 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 um, and not on, not on the gun. Um, Da, da, da. I am also looking into hunting for my dog, but he is a coursing dog, which means he runs down game like rabbits. What are good resources for hunting with dogs? Where did the bulk, where they do, what are good resources for hunting with dogs where they do the bulk of the chasing and taking of game? Um, I mean, I, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I honestly don't know, but I also know that a lot of the training I do comes from like a breed group or a type of like, so I have a, I part of an official unofficial training group for pointers, right? Like, go ahead, Kang. I, I didn't mean to. No, no, no. I was just going to say, you know, keep going, keep going. <laughs> it's, it's literally, you, you, that is definitely yeah. one of those things where you have to find your people and they're out there. I mean, there, there's just, there's sight hounds and, um, I, I'd even start with an obedience club and asking around because someone, someone always knows someone, right? Yep. Like, let's be honest. Yeah, if yep. you have a, you know, if you have a traditional hunting dog, start with the breed group, like a breeder, the breed group clubs, that will be, you know, where you'll find where they're doing, you know, their training and stuff. If you have a non-traditional hunting dog, like let's say a pit bull or a border collie, you know, don't let anybody tell you that they can't hunt. You just they're learning just like you. So if you want to hunt with them, take them out. Just make sure they're not gun shy. They're not running, you know, <laughs> yeah, two hundred yards away from you. But you know, like, it, you know, any dog can hunt. Really, don't let anybody tell you that you can't. So, nice. and they love to hang out, right? Like dogs really are the companion in this. Um, yep. If that's the kind of hunting you want to do, like it really. At the end of the day, I talk about my friends. And I talk about hunting with family, but at the end of the day, the, the person running shotgun is really rad. Like, so. Absolutely. Um, what would be the best beginner's gun to start with or bow? Um, you know, it, it really depends on what you're trying to do uh, and, and how you're trying to do it. I usually recommend, you know, if you can get a decent pump shotgun, it will do everything you want to do in Minnesota. Um, and in some places it may be the only way you can hunt deer. Uh, so it's, it's very versatile, um, and, and you can customize it to, to what you want to do a bow. If you're going to start with bow, I would get one. They make, um, they make bows that are highly adjustable. So bows, you have to fit the bow, uh, in terms of how you draw it back and, and what the poundage is. So I would recommend one that is highly adjustable and they, they make those, they're out there. Um, so make sure you get a, an adjustable draw length bow so you can get it to fit you and you're not, you're not um, having to get a lot of extra a, uh, aftermarket parts. All right, we got a few of these left. I'm gonna try to blaze through them. Do you feel the pattern of camo is important? Short no. answer, no. <laughs> nope, you don't even need camo. You know, if it's earth tones, if it's greens and browns, if it's baggy, no. you'll be fine. The, the animals don't care. Uh, sitting still will do more than camo any day of the week. Um, there's some other questions answered. Ba, ba, ba. What would you suggest as a starting point for someone who has never done any hunting or fishing before? You know, waterfowl, deer, rabbit, etc. Um, do you all have a preference? If, if you, you know, hunting and fishing is kind of uh, different. So if you want to do fishing, just start fishing first. If you want to do hunting, uh, for me personally, I got into it with a dog, so and waterfowl and upland hunting. So that's where that's where I say it is, or small game. So mm -hmm. where all you need is, you know, you don't need if you don't have a dog, something that you can do without a dog. That's that's a good starting point. Rabbit, squirrel, can be ducks yeah. too. So uh, yeah, I've got to I've got to back you on that. It, small game is not easy game. It like let's not pretend, but. But small game is a great way to get started. And I know people who hunt grouse. They seriously, they're out there in their jeans and their camping, hunt, hiking boots with, you know, grandpa's 12 gauge and, the, and they're out there. And you just, you know, wear your blaze, 
use the hunter walking trail and um and kind of go for it like I would turn again to the conservation orgs for some for some help or or the DNR for um, an event, but it really is like you can get out there. You can get out there without a dog. Um, I I don't want to anymore <laughs> now that I have a dog and who brought me to hunting. But um, you can hunt without a dog. Absolutely, I I do not have a dog, and so um, I don't hunt with a dog. In terms of where you want to start, I would say um, be honest about what you're trying to get out of it. You know, if if it's uh, different hunting styles do different things. Um, if you're looking for a freezer full of meat, even though it may be intimidating, starting with deer hunting is not a crazy notion. If you're, if it's impossible for you to sit stone still for hours on end, don't start with turkey hunting. You know, start with squirrel hunting. Start, start because you can walk and talk, and it's it's usually a little bit more laid back, and um, you know the squirrels don't mind as much. So. Be honest about what you're trying to get out of it. Be honest about the experience that you're looking for. And that's something when you start talking to new, to experienced hunters, that's also something to bring to that conversation and be like, be honest with what you're trying to get out of it. And even if they're not that person, they can point you to somebody who is usually. So if they're like, hey, you know what? I, I don't own a dog. I can't help you with that. But Larry down the street or Janine across the way, they're, they're more than happy to do it. So, um, we are over time, uh, so thanks everybody for sticking around. Um, I did look in the chat really quickly. Um, there's some great comments in there. We can't get to all of them. There is one that I do want to address. Is it worth practicing setting up a tree stand before taking out into the field? 100% absolutely yes. Um, please practice with your gear. Make sure you know it's safe. Make sure you know how it operates. Similar to the gun situation, you don't want to be trying this stuff out for the first time in the field. I know we said, you know, doing a dry run with hunting is, you know, that's, there were some yays, there were some nays. Um, the point is, is that make sure you know your gear when you go out. And especially when it's something like a tree stand or a firearm, most of the accidents that happen when hunting are people falling out of tree stands. So be solid with that before you take it out. And you can do that in your backyard and it's, it's no big thing. Um, where do I get my deer tested for CWD? Um, CW, we, we've got a lot of tests going on with CWD. Please check the CWD website uh, with the DNR uh, for the most current information. Um, so great um, tips on information with Hank Shaw. I know Julie is a big fan of Hank Shaw. Um, and then um, some uh you know the the meat eater media empire has a lot of tremendous um hunting and cooking books they've got I've, I've lost track of how many recipe books they've come out with but those are both really good uh, media places to start um you know our local modern carnivore um is also a, a tremendous resource he he's local minnesotan and yeah he's the one who took the meat eater guys out dark house spear fishing uh last winter so yeah you know, if, if if meat eaters go into somebody, you know that they've got they've got uh, some 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 chops. Okay, it is 105. Julia King, do you have any last second recommendations for folks? Um, just you know, go out there, be you know, try it. Don't let anybody tell you that you can't do it. Um, be safe and have fun. You know? all it start all it takes is just to start. That's all you gotta do. Just start. That is, that's the best advice I got. Like you go out, go out with your dog, go out with your dog, make mistakes, you know, like find a WMA that is a parking lot. <laughs> like you might not actually see anything, but, but just, just go out there. Um, I want to, I want to extend, I really do like we're available online. You can find us both online. You can ask questions anytime. We might just point you right back to the DNR website <laughs> with a smile and a nod. But I will, I mean, we'll answer questions and you'll find people online. There are, I mean, just don't be afraid to ask. Speak up. Fantastic. With that, it is 105. Thank you everybody for sticking around. Julia King, thank you so much for your perspectives. It's been tremendous to hear your voices. It's been tremendous to hear your stories. I really appreciate it. Uh, for everybody uh, who's who's held on for the five minutes over, thank you for your patience. Thank you for your I, I don't remember the last time we had this many questions. So thank you so much for being engaged and, and active. 
Um, if you need to get a hold of us, please reach out. Uh, you can find us. Benji and Craig have been putting a lot of stuff in links in the chat. You, you, you know where we're at. So reach out, let us know. Please get out there, be safe, be ethical, um, and, and enjoy it because it really is a, a, a special way to, to, to move through the woods. So thank you so much. I'm going to stop the recording. We're going to go back into our digital green room. Y'all have a wonderful rest of the week. Enjoy whatever holidays you may be observing. Enjoy the time off. And um, if you get it, and if you don't, I am very sorry because you deserve it. You deserve a break. You deserve a break. Thanks, everybody. Y'all have a good one. Thank you, James. Thank you, everybody.